Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Philosopher Clock with Eche Fatoum. Today, we are taking a journey into the unknown. What is this going to be? I don't know. We need to call him and find out. We're going to call Dr. Eche Fatoum. This is Larry the Lizard behind me. Eche Fatoum, he's here. Mm -hmm. Hello? Hello? Please hold. Oh, I can hear you now. It's fixed. Yeah. Welcome back to uh, Europe, I guess. You had a nice long journey there. Uh, we went back in between. So I flew to Costa Rica twice this year, which is a bit of a um, climate sin, I guess. Mm -hmm. But it was for good purposes, would be my defense. Or I really wanted to do it. N not sure if the action is dependable, but it, it happened. So there's little to be done about it now, other than maybe uh, paying for CO2 compensation. Mm. We can't be perfectly environmentally conscious. I think we have some big picture problems that we maybe don't need to guilt trip ourselves over taking an extra flight here or there. You had also a, a pretty interesting set of goals with the trip it wasn't just leisure you had some personal exploration in mind yeah so what we did um this year and this was initially anna's idea was we went into a ayahuasca retreat in costa rica and today we want to talk about that because i'd be struggled not to talk about it in some way shape or form so we kind of get it out of the way and it it had a profound impact on me and it will likely have an impact on how i approach these lectures as well in the future it kind of changed my outlook on some things in a good way hmm. and since we're going to talk about a substance that is considered a schedule one illegal substance in the US. Um, I think we need a couple of um, things to be said beforehand. <laughs> so first off, this is not um, something you should do, especially if it's illegal where you are at. So we're not advertising for any illegal drug use. And also the whole topic of drugs is rather difficult to talk about. And I'm not someone that is saying drugs are bad per se, but they can get problematic rather quickly. And if you're in a situation where you struggle with drug abuse, be this of the legal or illegal kind, um, try to look for help and try to get that sorted because even though you might not feel the immediate impacts of of this behavior, it will eventually lead to problems and it's better to find help before that rather than when it's too late. Mm -hmm. Easier to fix an issue in the early game than the late game. To borrow a stock rep, Tim. Absolutely. And yeah, I also want to say I'm not an expert on the whole topic of ayahuasca. Like I did a bunch of reading into it, but it's a 5,000 year old tradition. And we, we as a Western society only learned about it rather recently. So I don't know everything about it, but feel free to ask and I'll try to answer as best as I know. 
So this will not be like a, a lecture on what the substance is. I will just basically telling you what happened to me for the most part, also a bit about what happened to Anna during our retreat for you to kind of get a sense of what you would expect when you go do such a thing. Hmm. I can say I've had a few psychedelic experiences that would be maybe adjacent to it. I haven't had your experience, so I don't know how close it is, but uh, one of the things that we study in brain science is the way that different drugs act on the body. And it, it also made me kind of think about which ones would I consider being interesting to experience versus ones that I want to avoid at all costs. And one of the ones that uh, I guess you could say a class of drug that I've decided to avoid is opiates, just because it's a, a type of substance that works directly on the pain pleasure pathways of a person, which makes them very viscerally physically addictive. There's a lot of different things we're addicted to in life that we like. Say, World of Warcraft, people can pour a lot more of their life into that game than they should because it has a bunch of moments in the game where you feel productive and you feel good about what you're doing, but it's not physically addictive to where you're going to be hurting and having pounding headaches because you can't play the video game. But with certain drugs, especially opiates, you definitely can. So due to that, I just said, okay, I'm not even going to try to test my resolve and ability to stop using something. I'm just never even going to put my body in that situation. So doing research first is a really good step to just being aware of how things affect us. There are a lot of different psychoactive substances in the world. I've tried a good few of them. It's been a long time, so I don't really have fresh memory of it per se, but the pursuit of, I guess you could say, expanding the horizons of consciousness is really interesting. And it can bear a lot of fruit, but there's quite a bit of stigma attached to it. I think just the general war on drugs that happened in the US has had a lot of impact around the world in just making the, the broad-based sledgehammer approach of drugs bad, okay, and we're just going to make them illegal except for the ones that are already accepted by uh, Western society, like alcohol and caffeine and things, which are still drugs, and you can have really interesting experiences with those, but they're used so often that they're more or less culturally accepted. Whereas ayahuasca, it's accepted there where you had it, in Costa Rica, but I think it's illegal in the United States. Uh, something like magic mushrooms, that's also a naturally occurring substance that is illegal, but they've been gradually peeling back the restrictions on how you can research that. And they found that it has a lot of benefits for helping people overcome long-term trauma, PTSD, things like that. There's something about a lot of these psychedelics that is like a semi reset button on the brain where you get stuck in these loops where you think in a certain pattern and whenever you have something that forces you to change the pattern, sometimes you don't go back to the pattern after the trip is over. This could be for the better. Yeah, it's uh, interesting the use of substances goes way further back than we have um, written down knowledge of. So there seems to be a inherent wish in people to kind of experience something beyond themselves. Mm -hmm. And as you said, this has been illegalized, especially during the Nixon era. And I think we've, there was good reason to do it at the time, but we're also losing something in terms of healing value in terms of just value for people um, when they want to do it. And 
I'm of the mindset that for the most part, making things where you do not hurt others by doing it illegal is not productive. But that's a, a legal issue that kind of every country has to sort for themselves, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is the common sense approach of if there were a substance that was just very directly harmful to your population and people are being killed by this or they're hurt in some way, then yeah, obviously you want to protect your people. So having a law in that case makes a lot of sense. Uh, but a lot of these substances, we don't fully know exactly how they work. We're kind of gradually chipping away at it, but then it's really hard to research drugs that are illegal. You have to go through a lot of paperwork and extra steps and stuff to sort that out. So we'll see where it goes, but things are gradually opening up. A lot of the states in the US have been legalizing cannabis. That's kind of the first step approach it's something that a lot of people may have tried. It's one of the weaker substances in terms of the intensity of effect and stuff. So as that becomes more acceptable, then uh, other things can kind of be brought into question as well of something we could potentially say, okay, there's use for adults to have this if they're in the right situation. So you're saying that in this case, weed would actually be a gateway drug? Yes. <laughs> yeah, they say cannabis is a gateway drug. That was one of the the scare tactics, you could say, for a lot of these avoid drugs programs. And again, it's a sledgehammer approach where it says drugs are bad in K and you just say across the board, don't do this, which means that you could potentially get people who just decide not to do drugs because you successfully startle them about it but then at the same time you don't educate them about the actual differences between things like between weed and cocaine there's a very big difference in the the danger level for a person if they're offered weed at a party versus cocaine at a party one of these is not like the other and one of them you could overdose and really hurt yourself the other you wouldn't so that can sort of break trust with people if you teach them the wrong way with how dangerous stuff actually is for them. If you want a quick tip on a way that weed is actually dangerous, it does have some lasting impacts on memory, especially your working memory. Uh, it, especially if you take it when you're young. So say younger than like 20 or so when the brain is still developing. So watch out for that. There's a really good reason to have it be 21 plus in that case. And then another one would be if you have people in your family tree who are either schizophrenic or schizoaffective, then it can cause you to have a psychosis episode. And that's no bueno. So be careful of that if that's a risk factor for you. But aside from that, it is one of the less dangerous ones as far as the science looks. Again, this is not an endorsement. It's just hopefully a, a more accurate take than what the FDA might say. Or not the FDA. What's the, the agency of the U.S. government that hunts down drug people? DEA, Drug Enforcement. That's what it is. Yeah. Yeah, but I guess that would be for um, production and distribution more so than uh, any single person taking drugs. Yeah, correct. Um, I, When it comes to drug policy, I kind of like what Portugal has been doing for, I think... 20 years by now so they basically said that we're gonna decriminalize the use of illegal substances um while still making distribution and production illegal so you're taking away the possibility to 
put people into prison due to their drug abuse, but rather spending all the money that would go there into prevention and to healing people with addiction. And as far as I can tell, it's been a rather successful model for them, like in terms of addiction going down and the associated cost of addiction going down. Mm -hmm. You did fetch a link for us before we started for an addiction uh, hotline. If you wanted to post that in chat, that could be cool. Yeah. That's something that people ask in chat about fairly often. I'm not an expert in it, and just as a disclaimer, I'm not a licensed therapist or anything, so you shouldn't take advice if you actually have an addiction that you're struggling with. Talk to a professional, see what they can do. I am a simple Zerg streamer here who likes talking about big picture stuff sometimes too. Ah, this reminds me, I have a brain, brain science question about addiction. Maybe you know this. Um, do you know what area of the brain is active when we're... Um, like when the addiction is active, basically when we're longing for a certain substance, what um, part of the brain would light up? Hmm. I don't know if it's consistent across drugs. It seems like it would be different. And sometimes it wouldn't be the region lighting up. It would be the region not lighting up enough. So your behavior changes to try to get that back. A really common theme for how a bunch of different drugs work on the brain is they're not actually like making you feel that way as soon as it enters your body, it goes into your body and then it sends a signal to your brain to release something. Like say for example, MDMA, which is sometimes called ecstasy or molly or whatever, it's releasing serotonin that's already basically being stored in your brain, like a little tank of stuff. And whenever you take the drug, it says, okay, unleash all the serotonin, which is a lot of serotonin. That's more serotonin to drop at once than the brain normally would. That would be like only in the case of you just won the Boston Marathon and you are beside yourself with the level of achievement in your life and you just feel so ecstatic about it. Like those experiences can happen without drugs. You add some kind of drug that just artificially tells the brain, okay, well, fire away the serotonin now. You didn't exactly win the Boston Marathon, but you might feel that way based on the chemicals that have been existing in your head and they were just released because of that reason. So yeah, I don't think it's a particular place for every single drug. Depends on which one. Another thing that's uh, a fun one to think about is the way that hallucinations work. Uh, some people believe that things are like visions and you're actually seeing certain stuff. Um, basically, whenever someone is taking a psychedelic and they're seeing swirls of color and shapes and things like this, their visual cortex is doing a lot of stuff that it's not. And the way I understand it is basically your executive cortex, which is in the front of your brain where your forehead is, is normally keeping things in order, making sure everything is prioritized correctly of like the visual stuff is this level of importance and it stays here. The audio stuff is this level of importance and it stays here. And then you introduce some psychoactive and you can basically pass the keys of the car from the executive, which is the front of your brain, to the visual cortex and the visual cortex can draw whatever it wants to based on what it's seen so far and then just kind of the base geometry methods that the brain uses to create shapes and images and stuff. It's very interesting the way the visual cortex stuff works. One thing that I realized from it and is kind of a misconception is people don't usually, it can happen, but they don't usually hallucinate like whole things. Like you don't have some drug and then you see a dragon. That's more rare. What's more common is you would see patterns that are basically the mathematical structure for how your brain makes images in general. But the brain is kind of 
being naughty in the short term where it's just making whatever image it wants rather than just seeing what's directly in front of it and making an image based on its best judgment, which is what it's supposed to do. Yeah, I didn't have a, a, a visual experience in that way, but there were uh, plenty of people. Basically, there were 70 people in this resort and all doing the medicine together. Mm -hmm. And a bunch of them reported about seeing what they called the sacred geometry. Yep. And I guess this is what you're referring to here. That's yes. interesting. I didn't know that. I have seen that. And it's basically the same for everybody. That's one of the universally human kind of coded in parts of our brain is where we're pulling from some base shapes that everyone has more or less. And then we're synthesizing an image based on what our eyes are giving us for raw data. But you take the, the drugs and then the, the patterns just show themselves as they are with some added creativity, I'm sure. Yeah, the way the brain makes images is pretty awesome. All right, so kind of trying to figure out how to, to start us into the story. Um, Once upon a time. Ah, I started my diary with a lovely quote from Dante, basically, I'm not 100% sure if it's the first line of the Divine Comedy, or if it's a bit later on. Uh, basically, he says, uh, midway through the journey of life, I find myself in a forest dark, for the straightforward path was lost. So, Dante, in this case, is... Um, is at a point where he's not sure how and where to go forward to. And I think that this is a feeling that a lot of us can relate to, where we're kind of uncertain about what the future further could look like, and therefore how we should approach it. And again, we're not advertising to, to do... Um, any illegal substances to, to find yourself, find that way, to help yourself find that way. But it can be beneficial. And yeah, this is the story about how ayahuasca has helped me, has helped, I guess, many people so far. Um, so the initial idea came from my wife. The, um, her work as a coach and her coach um, having worked with the substance has told her about the potential benefits it has and how it's um, basically ayahuasca is a substance that makes you go inward rather than outward meaning that you'll you'll be forced to to look at yourself in the mirror or to 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 go deep inside of you to to figure stuff out rather than having visions which could be a part of it as well though like it's it's a bit of a mixed bag you're not sure what you're getting um the saying usually goes that the medicine will not give you what you want it will give you what you need which I was skeptical about, well, I guess I still am to some degree, um, but in my experience, this has been true, where it it's not something you can control, and you just have to see where the journey takes you, which is a rather interesting um, challenge in terms of surrendering to the experience and trying not to rationalize it in the process. Yeah, if you went into it expecting it to make sense, like, day to day, then you're going to be a little bit alarmed.
There are a lot of fours. Just wanted to mention that. <laughs> and he was on his journey in the jungles of Costa Rica, and he realized something very profound. Thors are really good units. <laughs> Yeah, so I think I want to start there where, for me, um, a lot of the the things that are kind of behind this work with Ayahuasca, I was really skeptical about, where it's like, all right, it can heal all these things, which likely not the case, which isn't to say that it's not helpful at all. But there's a lot of claims out there that are beyond the capabilities of ayahuasca. Mm -hmm. And what's mentioned many times, especially if you put a bit of effort into the research, it's that ayahuasca can help you get clarity on some things or um, see a different path, but it's I, I like to compare it to when you're driving a car in the rain. Ayahuasca kind of works as the windshield wiper, where you get clear vision for a brief second in order to, to know where you're heading again. Mm -hmm. But it's not a sustainable solution. Mm -hmm. You can't be on so, ayahuasca all the time. Well, there's some people that do that, but I don't think that'd be <laughs> any good for anyone. Yeah. Um, but for, for you to see again, you want it to stop raining. And the windshield wiper only shows you, all right, keep going straight forward or turn left or right. And in order for ayahuasca to be beneficial to you, the much bigger part of the work is integrating what you've learned afterwards and basically making changes to your life according to your new insights. Which I think is what, what ties this back in with philosophy, philosophy of living especially, where we talked a bunch about this leap of faith of doing something, or how we're at least theoretically, ethically improvable. Mm. So ayahuasca can be beneficial in you realizing something about your life but then you need to make the changes according to that. Otherwise, it was just one nice experience. Mm -hmm. It's like um, going through life, um, always watching depressing TV, and then you watch one nice show and you feel happy and good about it, but you're back to the depressing TV afterwards. It will not be a, a sustainable effect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, so going into this rather um, skeptical, but not in a sense where I didn't want to do it. I was excited to see what this will bring about. Um, one of the first things I did after we arrived there was um, to make the conscious decision to get my skepticism and my cynicism out of the way just for the purpose of the week we spent there mm -hmm. because it's obviously not helpful for for it to be a good experience mm -hmm. and i thought to myself that i might as well go back to the cynicism um once i'm back home and i did to some degree but the experiences i made um, were quite good so it's I, I'm skeptical of a lot of the surroundings but I think the, the medicine itself for me has been a really nice experience so I, I'm also willing to to cut some slack on, on some of the things I see more critical surrounding it hmm And I feel that this practice of surrender and just um, 
taking in what there is to take in has been rather helpful. I think I would have a completely different experience otherwise. Yeah, if it's kind of like gripping the wheel in a sense, the wheel of the car, where whenever you're in a kind of different environment, you can grip onto that and try to make sure you keep to the same course, or you can let go of the wheel and see where the journey takes you. And it seems like to get best value, you opted to try to let go of the wheel relative to what your like standard instincts might have been. One of my most constant, um, I say that reoccurring dreams for, I haven't had it in a long time, but I want to say from like 25 till 30 was me in a car on the passenger seat or on the back seat, realizing that, oh fuck, um, there's something that should be driving this thing. Mm -hmm. or someone uh, I don't um, have a big opinion of kind of interpreting dreams that way but I think that's that's just a clear sign of wanting to, to be in control of your whole life mm -hmm. or of your own life yeah I, I like that analogy with the driver mm-hmm or I guess I don't like it since it seems problematic for me. <laughs> oh. Do you not drive? Oh, I do. Oh, you do. So why is it problematic? Uh, because uh, I, I had this reoccurring dream that basically was telling me that I'm not driving. Like I'm, I'm driving a car, but I'm not driving my own life. Oh. Yeah, I have the feeling that you drive a percentage of your life because so much stuff in your life is RNG, to use a gamer term. It's stuff happening around you that's random chance. Sometimes it favors you, sometimes it doesn't. It's us modified by the RNG opportunities that we get. Um, how did the thing go? Uh... Luck is when preparation, preparation meets opportunity. Meet. Exactly. Yep. And bad luck is RNG taken personally. Mm. True. All right. So you you go over there and then you decided to experience that as a, a local cultural custom and they have a bunch of ritual to the practice that is probably different from how someone might use a psychedelic or something at home because this is something that they've done there locally for a long time yeah so ayahuasca is not native to Costa Rica mm -hmm. I think it's um, native to the Amazon region, so Brazil, uh, Colombia, especially. Mm -hmm. And it has about a 5,000 year tradition there, which I'm not sure how they came up with that number, but since it's not me faking the statistics, I might as well put it out there. So that number seems a little bit weird to me, mainly because I would wonder when did people first migrate to Costa Rica or to Central and South America because it partly depends on what your theory is for how humans got to all the continents but the the main one I think is the out of Africa where Homo sapiens was in Africa first and then they went across the land bridge uh, kind of over Egypt into like Israel and whatnot and kind of going north through the Tigris and Euphrates and then chilling there, the Fertile Crescent, and then expanding outward from there. So relatively speaking, humans would have gotten to South America as one of the last places because it's so far away. They I migrated more than 5,000. To Australia in the first place. That seems like a really long swim. 
the Polynesians were people who were really good at making boats for early in their time. When did they migrate? Chad is saying that it was a long time ago. Can you give us a date range? Ballpark. Tens of thousands of years? I think that 10,000 years ago is basically not... Um... 12,000 years ago is around the time when we started to have um, agriculture and therefore um, settled people develop. Mm -hmm. But that would mean that the nomadic people um, were a thing long before that. And as soon as you start to settle, you're not likely to um, go to have a walk towards Central America mm -hmm. from Africa or any place. Yeah, I think agriculture was ballpark 10,000 years ago. Not everyone gets it at the same time, but that's when it started being a, an edge that certain peoples used. Yeah, um, yeah. once you arrive there, it's a really, really nice resort, like four star ish. I'm not sure. I'm not. I um, don't have much experience with hotels, but it's just a super nice place. Um, the whole area is uh, secluded in the rainforest. Mm -hmm. So it's really quiet and calm. It's. I find it weird to say, but it seems like the place has this kind of energy where just everything is super peaceful. You have a lot of butterflies flying around. Um, I saw plenty of wildlife from frog to snake to an armadillo, skunks, just basically being around, not caring much. Mm -hmm. It was really nice. Especially the armadillo was super cute. I saw a family of armadillos for a quick side story. Um, whenever I was trying a psychedelic, our friends and I were just going for a walk. We took this trail and there was a big family of armadillos that was all kind of milling about in the grass just trying to get food and stuff. And uh, that was right when the stuff was hitting and it gave a really distinct feeling of oneness, of being part of that earth ecosystem with the armadillos that we're all here together and the earth that humans stand upon is equally vital to us humans as it is to armadillos we have some aspects of ourselves that we consider to be more advanced but yeah that was a a cool sort of pause in the ego where i got to think about being on the same team as the armadillo peoples They're really cute. True. They've got armor too, which is nice. So they have that kind of turtle aspect of it's an armored unit, which usually means they're less hostile and aggressive as well. I don't think armadillos attack people. <laughs> They'd have a hard time doing so. Yeah. Not, not many animals fare well trying to attack people. True. People are scary. They're pretty large. They're pretty mean. And they're also very resourceful in figuring out different ways to make use of you. Yeah. And the, their whole group tactics thing is kind of unfair. Many people with pointy sticks, even stronger than a woolly mammoth, true. Yeah. So you're in this really nice natural environment with all the creatures and stuff and that's setting a, a tone of tranquility and maybe reflection for people. I would guess for the people who were 
going to this place? Were they mostly local? Were they mostly from out of the country? What did the split seem like it was? Um, most of them were North American. Mm -hmm. And then there's some people from all over the place. Interestingly enough, uh, we were two out of five Swiss people, mm -hmm. which seemed kind of weird. Uh, um, they they had this saying where basically since you're doing the medicine together and you will hear the other people in the room, you will um, talk to the people over the day. It's like the it becomes the medicine family and mm. the saying goes that it it has reason that you're there together. Mm -hmm. which also something I'd see rather skeptical, but it, it kind of makes sense in hindsight. So I found it at the time to be interesting that there were five Swiss people. So you kind of had a means to communicate with each other in your native language. That's cool. Rather than having um, to speak English all the time, which is yeah, I guess it was beneficial. In Switzerland, you speak a lot of languages, though. So are you speaking like... Um, all of them were Swiss German, which is like a two-thirds chance that you're Swiss German when you're Swiss. Mm -hmm. it's about two-thirds um, Swiss German, one-fourth French, and the rest of people speaking Italian and then there's like a, maybe not even a hundred thousand speaking Romansh. Hmm. So and Swiss everyone German that speaks spoke. um everyone that speaks Romansh also speaks at least one other language because Romansh is not super useful in everyday life these days. Well here in America people speak American <laughs> Fancy Swiss. That's cool, though. It makes for some interesting political and social things when you when you're a country that just speaks a bunch of languages. Mm -hmm. um, one of the funniest thing I think is basically we have mandatory military. Mm -hmm. So unless you do it like me and declare yourself to be unable for military duty. Um, or let yourself to be declared that way, rather. Um, you'd go for 21 weeks of military mm -hmm. once you're 18 or 19. So you have all these people from Switzerland coming there, some of them speaking French, some of them speaking German, others speaking Italian. And most often than not, speak people speak speak English to each other because that's the one language we can kind of all agree that we at least know a bit of, mm -hmm. which is not an official language and you're not, it's very likely that you're learning it in school, but you're not required to learn. Yeah. So in terms of the people being there, uh, I'm obviously not gonna mention any names, um, but just for you to get a sense. So there's 70 people, most of them being North American and people went there for a variety of reasons. I'd say like 90% at least were there for it to be a healing experience or healing and or a spiritual experience i think you could say and there was a small minority of people who just wanted to get really high <laughs> and based on my conversations um those people that just went there to get really really high were rather disappointed at the end while almost everyone that went there to kind of get something different out of it was really stoked about the experience so this is to say that if you just want to get high, ayahuasca is not a party drug you'd enjoy. It's it's not a pleasant experience per se. And we'll get into that. 
Um, so many people being there for healing. There was a group of physicians from the United States, I think from Oregon or Utah. I'm not sure anymore. And so they came there specifically to, to get a sense of the, um, the value the substance could bring to people with addiction, people with anxiety, just just seeing how it works and if it's um, if it's even half as hyped up as it's made out to be. And based on what I've heard from them, they were rather, rather amazed by the effects. What were the effects? What were the effects? That's a good question. Um, so they they kind of set you up beforehand to 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 get you a sense of what you will be likely be experiencing. And there's four different types of experiences. They might mix and ma ma mix and match um, over the course of one night or the multiple nights you do the medicine for. Mm -hmm. And so the first would be the more immediate physical effects. Um, so the, the setup is like this. You, you basically, you go into the um, ceremony space, which is the Moloka, which is a, a hub or a, a, a house up on a hill in our case. And everyone that's there has their own mattress where you you drink the medicine, then you lay down on your mattress, try not to think, which is a rather difficult challenge for some people, especially me. Uh, and try to, to, to work with the medicine. So this is a, a, a big room with 70 mattresses on the floor. And you lay down and the, the first things you will likely experience are the your body reacting to the medicine in a physical way. So there's a couple of things that could happen. Um, the thing most commonly talked about is people puking. And I think this has to do with the fact that in in the medicine there's two different substances. One is the deep psychedelic uh, DMT, and if you would just ingest DMT, your stomach acid would tear it apart. So there's a second component in it which enables these proteins in your stomach that would dissolve the DMT for it to basically be uh, able to to go into your system. So it's changing your stomach has, environment. Yeah. And this has this purging effect to a lot of people where they need to puke. Which can be a bit distracting, trying, like laying on your mattress, trying not to think, and you hear a bunch of people puking around you. Don't think about anything. Uh, excuse me, I need help. Yes, what's your problem? Uh, I just thought about vomiting because <laughs> he's vomiting. <laughs> Yeah. What I do want to mention, though, is that it's not like the kind of vomiting you would do when you're sick, where it's really painful. It's more like if you had um, too much beer too fast and you just needed to get the excess beer out. Mm -hmm. So it, it's just like a rather brief, unpainful experience. It's not comfortable, especially since the medicine itself is not the tastiest thing you will ever have. So having that kind of taste back in your mouth, not super nice. Yeah, so puking, then you'd likely be going to the toilet a bunch of times. Um, these two might also combine at times. Um, Shivers or sweating are quite common. Also, you could have effects like starting to laugh or to cry. Basically, having emotions being uh, brought up to the forefront. Mm -hmm. 
and so all of these are kind of the the more immediate um, physical effects. And then there's three um, more spiritual things that could happen. Um, the first is what's called the punta. Puntas are the visions, broadly speaking. Uh, this is just you, I wouldn't say seeing things, like you could be experienced the, the sacred geometry as you were talking about before. The way I've experienced it is more your mind going a bit more crazy than usual, but being railroaded by the medicine. So it, it, it kind of tells you what to think about, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But it's not this visual experience you'd associate um, with it kind of like um how dumbo has this vision of pink elephants when he's drunk mm -hmm. or at least that's not what i've experienced but as i said the experience range a lot from person to person and from from evening to evening you do the medicine so you, you you never know what you get which makes it kind of scary and or exciting at the same time And this this mix of, of um, being scared and being excited for it has been quite common with most people I talk to. They're like, "Yeah, I'm kind of I'm kind of scared of what's about to happen, but I'm also kind of excited for it." Uh, and I think this is a, a good mix to go into this experience or into most other things as well, where you don't want to be. Um, too far on either of the sides of this spectrum where the anxiety kind of prepares you for it eventually going wrong and the excitement gets you going in the first place. Yep, you want to be excited enough that you're prepared and good to go, but not so much that you're panicking. It's a tricky balance to strike, especially when you're putting your mind in a new mode of operation one of the things that people stumble on a lot is the fear that their brain won't switch back to normal a normal sober state after it being altered by any mind-altering substance really yeah so there's little data on this so i'm i'm not going to give you any numbers what i've read is that the likelihood of this happening with ayahuasca is rather low there's a increased and rather um, big problem if you come in with certain um, mental problems beforehand, especially, uh, uh, what is it? Got a list here somewhere. Um... Um, schizophrenia, psychosis, personality disorder, bipolar disorder, among others, is what it says. So if you have any history with these um, kind of disorders, um, doing the medicine is a lot riskier than otherwise. But there's also good experience with it as well as bad experience. So it's not to say that something has to happen if you have these disorders but you're, you're under a lot more danger for something to happen, something bad to happen. Mm. And what's important there is um, in this place, and I think in many other places that um, offer uh, ayahuasca ceremonies, you have licensed physicians uh, on staff where you talk to them, they kind of assess your um, self-reported uh, medical history. So if you're not um, honest there, you should get away with anything, I guess. Mm -hmm. But 
I think it's important for two reasons. One is for their safety that they can minimize the, the risk of something happening, but also for yourself that you uh, feel well taken care of and you don't have to go into the experience more fearful than you already are. We're like, all right, this is a, a professional team taking care of me. And if something were to go wrong, they would knew what to do. Mm -hmm. Sitters is what they're called. Yeah. People who are sober and experienced with how the stuff works so that if someone is panicking and they need help, they know what kind of help to give them to calm them down. Yeah. Mm. And I think this is a, a good lesson there for um, any kind of substance like this, where you want people around you that are not on the substance that could take care of you and kind of prevent you from doing uh, stupid things. Um, we kind of read about different experiences with, um, I think in this uh, the example I'm about to bring was about doing mushrooms. Mm -hmm. And they said that, um, I think 60% of people that use them regularly or often have had a, a really bad experience with them. Like um, a, a bad trip to where they would um, deem it the the most horrible um, experience of their life. But out of these people, what they said was only 3% of them had a, a trip sitter at the time. But I'm not sure if just this is so uncommon that this is not done in the first place or that the, the likelihood of um, a bad trip being a lot lower if you have a trip sitter. Mm-hmm. Like there's kind of um, so a, the, the problem with causation. Yeah, bad trips are definitely unpleasant if you take something that lasts for hours, because it's basically the person is unhappy with their mental state and they're powerless to change it. They're basically on a timer. Your brain is now stuck like this for the next two to nine hours, depending on what you had and how much of it you had. And that's pretty unfun. A lot of people, they they think of drugs as like a spooky thing that's automatically, ooh, you just feel super good. Some of them you feel pretty weird and you do have to keep your mental footing and your balance and also just keep the vibe positive so it is fun. Because if someone falls into the vortex of, oh crap, I don't want to be like this. I don't know if I'm going to be the same after this. Uh, I think someone knows that I did this and I'm paranoid that can be very unfun and yikes so the big plus of a sitter or someone who's experienced around you could be a therapist if you're doing this like in a clinical sense um, they can reassure you and basically ground you and kind of redirect your focus to a more positive line of thinking because we all kind of think as a group in some ways and we echo the energy that other people are projecting around us. So if you're in a room where everyone is super mad, you feel that hostile energy and that becomes a part of your mood at the time as well. So for these psychedelic trips as well, people have the capacity to maybe start running on a bad line. They start looping and thinking about something that's negative and they can't stop it. And another person in the room, also maybe someone who is sober, can more or less say, okay, you have your needs met, you're in a safe environment, I know factually speaking that you will be fine. And you can kind of bring it back to earth. Yeah. Yeah, and as you said, like the mental state you have from beginning to end of, of that rock trip, it will make a world of a difference. And being in an environment where you can feel safe and you, you can also trust your shaman, medicine person, whatever you want to call them, to, to know what dose of the medicine or of the drug you're able to stomach mm. is really helpful where you can surrender having to think about it. So ayahuasca as a substance is 
non-addictive in terms of the uh, what is it DSM four or five criteria. This means that two things are not present in in ayahuasca that we would usually associate with addiction. Uh, the first of it is there's no um, forget what the word for it is when you have to take more and more of it for it to have the same effect tolerance build up exactly so ayahuasca doesn't build tolerance it's um you actually need less over time like if you do it um more regularly over time you need less to get the same effect hmm. which is kind of interesting what what the as far as the lore goes it kind of says that once you have the medicine in you it's working with you whether or not you have it in you or not and you just kind of need a reminder of it for it to to kick in again that sounds a lot like jesus <laughs> <laughs> well they have certain similarities and there's yeah there's uh, this weird um basically the the medicine comes from a Colombian tradition or a, a um, Brazilian tradition, but they mix it up with a lot of new age spirituality, be it Buddhism, yoga, and it, it's like this this mix of things that don't necessarily belong together but seem appealing to a Western audience. Mm -hmm. All so the mystical is, shit, we get this as a mystical bundle. <laughs> Yeah. Maybe you're into mystical yoga. Maybe you're into healing crystals. Like, we've got the mystical stuff for you. Exactly. So th there's that. And that feels kind of weird, but also kind of nice. Like, I, I enjoyed it, but I see why people would uh, think of this as being rather weird. Uh, to each their own, I guess. Um, Where were we? Pip City. Ah. Yeah, so the, the visions are the, the second uh, thing that can and likely will happen to you. The third one uh, is called the consulta. It's being consulted by the med medicine or you being able to consult with the medicine. Um, I'm not sure how this looks like. I think it's more of a conversation you're having in your brain i don't think you're actually talking to someone but since i didn't have that experience i'm not sure how how i would describe it but it's like i think it's you answering your own question like getting clarity in the process mm -hmm. and this is something that i've noticed over time i don't think that um being on ayahuasca will um, it will tell you anything you don't already, to some degree, um, think to be true. Like, it's just, it's telling you you're right in your beliefs. Mm -hmm. Even though they believe, those beliefs might be objectively wrong. It's just, it's reinforcing um, what you deem to be true. Mm -hmm. So there's... Um, I don't think the medicine itself uh, follows the um, the rigorous uh, scientific approach where it needs to be quantified. It's just telling you, yeah, I, I believe this to be true, so it has to be true. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think you'd get any um, quantifiable um, insights into human nature. Which isn't to say that it's not a, a um, worthwhile experience. Like you, you, you get a new sense of the things you believe to be true, which is awesome already. But you have to see it kind of critical as well. Just because on, on one of your visions, um, you see aliens is not necessarily a sign that there are aliens or they're anywhere close to us. Mm. True. So there's like the, the difference between the um, what you're seeing on a trip to what 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 does it mean for my life, which is a lot about of what the integration is about. So basically, it's 
you'll, you'll see some weird stuff when you're on the medicine, but it's that's not the goal of it. Well, for some people it is. Um, the goal is more to get a lesson out of what the work with the medicine has told you and then reintegrating that lesson into your life. Hmm. Trying to have a purpose behind the trip. Yeah, and I think this is also something they prepare you for in terms of how to work with the medicine is you want to go into an ayahuasca experience with a goal in mind. And it's kind of not helpful to have this goal in the forefront, basically constantly thinking about, all right, this is my goal, this is my goal, this is my goal. But you want to have it in the back of your mind, knowing what to expect or what you could be looking for. Mm -hmm. And they provide you with a framework of three questions you could work on while on the medicine. Um, and the first one is, show me who I have become. So basically what you're asking the medicine or you're asking yourself for that matter with the help of the medicine is to, to get to a point of self-realization of who you have become compared to who you'd want it to be. Which I guess is the out of the, the three, um, three questions or the three contexts you'd given is the most difficult and most scary one to do. Where it's like, yeah, I don't really want to look at myself in the mirror. That kind of looks like I'd see a bunch of shit I don't want to see. But did you? See myself in the mirror? Yeah. Um, to some degree, I, I, I was expecting much worse than what I saw in the mirror. Uh, what? for this intention and this is the the first night of doing ayahuasca um what it told me or what it showed me was that i'm i basically neglected my um feelings and i'm just all in my head which to anyone listening to these conversations might not come as a surprise but that I'm, I'm basically neglecting a part of myself that is, I guess, less quantifiable, but in a sense, not less true. Like if I feel good or bad about something that is equally as true as being able as rationalizing it. Mm -hmm. And what the medicine told me was basically that this is in some sense, the, the wrong way to approach thing, and it's definitely the wrong way to approach the work with the medicine. Um, right, so we talked about the, the first three, and the, the fourth possible experience you could have is called the nada, which is Spanish for nothing. So I guess you it kind of implies what happens, which is to say nothing. So basically, you, you drink the medicine, you fall asleep, you'll wake up. And this is doesn't feel as rewarding, but in the Colombian tradition, this is kind of what you were aiming for. So the the goal of the medicine is to, to find peace and tranquility. And there's little things more peaceful than having a, a good night of sleep. True. And the the story goes that when you, when a nada happens, it's just um, the medicine working with you, working on you, on something you don't want to be present for. Uh, it's it's just doing a bunch of stuff, healing you um, while you're asleep. Not sure how uh, valid these claims are, but it's a, a good way of making people feel good when nothing happens, even though you paid a bunch of money to, to do drugs in a foreign country. Mm -hmm. 
and I'm not going to make any normative claims about that. Um, yeah, these are the, the four types of experiences you, you'd be likely to happen. There's some other stuff which I haven't experienced, but there's plenty of people reporting it. Um, people having a feeling of rebirth. Um, not sure how that feels since I, it didn't happen to me and I'm, I, I wouldn't know what to expect when you have a feeling of rebirth. Um, people having what's called um, sacred surgery where you basically feel a bunch of aliens, minions or whatever characters you imagine doing surgery on yourself, hmm. which this happened to a couple of people or a couple of people um, talked about this happening to them. And it's like the unease of not knowing what's happened, but it's not painful and not super scary, at least from what they reported. Does sound also, weird as a concept? Absolutely. <laughs> a, a, a lot of stuff will sound weird over the course of this discussion, and I have to say that, um, as I said in the beginning, I kind of uh, let go of my skepticism surrounding it. And yeah, whether you experience a surgery or a rebirth or just laying there and nothing happening, what's important is what you take away from it. It's not what you saw in the vision mm. and if you if you have this experience of a surgery and basically get up the next day and you feel healed this is already super beneficial to you mm -hmm. like it, it's i think that there's obviously a difference between between being healed from an illness and just feeling healed from an illness but feeling healed will already make a big difference. This is why uh, the placebos are so effective, because once we believe something to be true, it will much, it will have a much bigger effect. The power of belief. All right, so now knowing what to expect, we're kind of going into the first night, which I already talked a bit about. Um, so one of the saying, and this comes back to the whole issue of trust and trusting the, the, the people that provide you with this experience to, to know what they're doing. The saying goes, don't think, drink. So you're in this, group set up and they again start out by um, telling you what to expect and, and what to do if something happens that you're not comfortable with, basically asking for help or just holding up your arm um, and someone will take care of you to their best knowledge. Um, and then you go lay down on your mattress while they um, prepare the medicine for intake, which is to say they're blessing it, they're playing some music, something similar to the thing we've listened to at the beginning. Um, there's always, there always was lovely life music. I uh, really enjoyed that part of it. And your goal while they prepare the medicine is to kind of already get into the right mindset, which is to say to to get really relaxed, to kind of shut off your thinking and just getting yourself ready for what's to happen without being, without having anticipation of it. Mm -hmm. And this takes like half an hour and then you're being called up to drink a cup of medicine, which is you get a shot glass, um, I think they all used to drink from the same cup, which obviously isn't super um, up to date with today's um, health problems or, or um, this this state of the uh, pandemic. So you, everyone gets their own cup, and you, you'd be served this picky 
brown earthy liquid which on my first cup I was anticipating it to be much worse than it was but it, this is not to say it's um, it's delicious by any stretch of the imagination it has this kind of chocolatey taste to it but not in a good way um, you drink your cup you go back to your mattress and then you're supposed to later wait for something to happen without anticipating the something. That usually goes for about an hour when you're then um, told to have a second cup if you want it or need it. And so the saying don't think drink is basically when you're in doubt whether or not you need a second cup or a third, or however many you had, once that question comes up, you already have your answer. Mm -hmm. Like if you, if, you do, if you shouldn't drink anymore, the question wouldn't even arise. So they just um, tell you to basically drink as much of the medicine as you can stomach. <laughs> which I did on the first two nights, which is to say five cups, which is a rather big amount, I've been told in hindsight. But it, it, it felt right at the time, and I would do it again, if uh, my mind tells me to. And for reference, Ed uh, Fatum is a sorry? fairly tall person, so five cups, but he's over six feet tall, so... Yeah, but I'm only like a hundred and thirty pounds. You weigh one thirty? Forty. Let me convert that. One forty five. Okay. So super lightweight for my height. Yes. You weigh less than me, and I'm shorter than you. Well, yeah, no, five not cups. Thirty kilos, half of that. Uh, yeah. So don't think, drink, which is to say, whenever you, you, the question arises, do I need more? Do I want more? This stuff is really disgusting. I might just well lay here and pretend I'm asleep. No, you just walk up there. Um, there's, in our case, this is different from where you go. Um, there were two um, shamans that were preparing and handing out the medicine alongside of like 20 people of the, the medicine family, which is the, to say the trip sitters that will take care of you. So there's about one trip sitter for every three and a half person, which seems sufficient. And uh, you go up there and then there's uh, the question, how are you doing? You say, yeah, that's not super pleasant, but I'm all right. Do you feel the medicine? Kinda, I guess. I'm not sure. I had to go to the toilet a bunch of times. Did you have any visions? No, not really. All right, here you go, have some medicine. And you can do that uh, um, as many times as you want or need over the course of an evening up until a certain time. I want to say like an hour or maybe two before the ceremony ends. So usually these things start around 6 p.m. and go up until 1 or 2 o'clock. So it's like five, six hour experience. And depending on how much you drank over the course of the night, it might take you a lot longer to kind of work through the medicine. And it has been in my experience. But like at some point they, they switch the light back on and have everyone sit together and talk about the experience. And you'd likely be, um, like getting down from your trip by that point, but if you drank five cups over the course of the night, you're still very much in it by that time. Mm. 
Yeah, so you're laying there, you start to feel um, something happening. You're not quite sure what it is or what it means. You'd likely be going to the toilet about an hour into digesting um, the medicine. Um, the first night, which was like the scariest or, or what the night I knew least what to expect since the second, third, fourth night, you kind of had the, the, the previous night as a reference. So I, I was quite interested in kind of hearing what's going on around me. And while I was laying there and I think I felt a bit cold or a bit warm, like having a bit of a feverish um, experience. Um, people started laughing, crying, puking, going to the toilet, like 20 minutes into the first cup and i was still laying there thinking yeah maybe something's happening is is there something happening hello no so the the experience really ranges um from person to person and it's it was quite amazing to me how, how quick it, it triggered something in some people and how little other people experienced um, no one naked or undressing, not that I was aware of, I don't think that's a thing. Um, there was over the course of the week, one person which had a, um, basically got so active in their trip that they wanted to first yell a bunch of stuff and then just going out, walking off, which is problematic because you can't take care of them. So they had to tie them down to their mattress what which uh, apparently is something um that happens but is not common mm. and i talked to them about it afterwards and they said they didn't uh like it wasn't pleasant at the time but they thought it was a good experience afterwards where they they kind of you're not you're you're lucid, like you're aware of what you're doing while on the medicine. You're not just you, or at least for me, this has been true. I, I knew how and where my mind was different from how it, it would usually be. But I wasn't in this state of delirium where you didn't know what you were doing afterwards, uh, as you would see when you had way too much alcohol. So the the person kind of realized, all right, they they probably doing a good thing and they're doing me a service here, which wasn't necessarily how they felt at the time, but it it didn't feel bad for them in hindsight. Yeah. So if being tied down to a mattress is your thing, maybe go crazy on ayahuasca. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, so you're there, you, you drink the medicine. Some people feel the effects rather immediately. Other people, like me, take a really long time for anything to happen. So I drank a lot of it and was always, like I was really struggling to, to um, switch off my head and to, to do what I was supposed to. Um, up until the point when things were already ending. Mm. But by that point, I was really in the midst of it. Having drank uh, five cups, I was... It's difficult to describe. I was hot and cold. I was shivering. I was feeling really miserable. Like It wasn't a um, pleasurable experience by any stretch of the imagination. But I, at least I felt something, which I was kind of, um, I was hoping to feel something, so that that's what happened. And I remember uh, the shamans in like the, the post ceremony speech they gave when you share thoughts. Um, her name was, or still is, uh, Carolina, the shaman. She's originally from Germany and has like, learned this 
afraid of being able to prepare the medicine for an audience for plenty uh, a couple of years and would be considered what we call a newer shaman which is not someone that comes from the tradition but someone outside that learned it and she talked about one of her practices that she started to adopting which she called radical acceptance and for me this was kind of in line with stoic thinking where it's just like you do not try to change things that you do not have power to change where it's just you're being accepting of all the um, of all the things you're not in control over and radically so and this really struck a, a nerve with me at the time just laying there not being able to to move because it felt quite similar to to the thing we've talked about i think on the last episode maybe the one before this this whole notion of, of being optimistic for the future mm -hmm. i thought these two things are quite similar so after about want to say an hour although it's hard to kind of have any sense of time while you're on the medicine um about an hour after things had officially ended i was still laying on my mattress and thought now nah, i want to go up to do do the really long and hard walk up to the shamans which was i want to say less than five meters <laughs> in order to talk to them and so I got there uh, and just kind of wanted to talk through what was happening and why. I felt like this wasn't such a nice thing because nothing, nothing cool worth telling about was happening. At least until that point. And I wanted to hear about this whole practice of radical acceptance and what that means and how to to kind of um, how one would go about um, having this in their life. So I sat there talking to them and while I was sitting there, it kind of the nausea and the, the bad feeling of the trip um, faded out and it kind of went over into a euphoric state where my mind was just going totally crazy. And we talked a lot about languages and how they relate, how we're making up different symbols, how we're, um, we're basically, once we want to communicate an experience, we're forced into a certain language into, in order to make something like this um, tangible for another person, we're limited in, in conveying the experience. Because we, they, they will not be able to, to feel what we felt at the time, but we're, we're able to still kind of convey it to some degree. And just this notion of language, how we're um, putting feelings into words, putting thoughts into words that are not necessarily those words, but are at least semi-related, um, was super interesting to me and my, my mind went crazy on this notion crazy in a good sense where it was just um basically on a roller coaster ride um with those ideas and it was like a super weird pleasant kind of experience this going on while we're still have, having the conversation and I remember that they told me that, like, I, I tried to share this experience and what was happening with them. And they told me to, to try to bring it back to simplicity. Like, it, it's nice to, to see all of this unfolding. But in order to get something out of it, you want to make it simple again, rather than just make it more and more complicated. Yeah, so this is where I thought, all right, I might as well try to get some sleep, which obviously wasn't going to happen. So I 
just walked around for a while trying to make sense of all of what's happening and trying to figure out what uh, what there is at the core of this unfolding of language or what there is at the core of our thinking or my thinking i guess it's a better way to say uh, to frame it and it took me a while to kind of wrap my head around it and what i figured out was that it's this feeling of oneness that is described uh, very often when people talk about their experience with ayahuasca specifically but also other um, psychedelics where you feel like everything being one and the universe just being this unfolding of the the oneness of everything i guess the the notion of the the dao is kind of related to that or is a, a good framework to to make sense of it as much as the dao makes sense the primordial ohm yeah exactly this was this was the experience i had was everything coming from from this this oneness everything kind of wrapping back into it it was to some degree it was a visual experience as well it was, it's weird to describe because it wasn't a vision per se but i still saw pictures in my mind's eye mm -hmm. And yeah, the, the notion was, all right, everything's coming from this notion of oneness, this ohm sound, as you said, and just it unfolds from there. And it all goes back into it as well, where there, everything's kind of there, but like when everything's there, also nothing is there, but when nothing's there, everything's there as well. So it's, it was really difficult to describe, but it was, it felt beautiful at the time, which I guess is good enough. But as I said before, it's like, all right, like, wh what am I supposed to do with this? Is this helpful in any way or is this just something weird my mind made up at the time and kind of felt good? Mm -hmm. So the next morning I tried to, to wrap my head around it and what the, the question always becomes, okay, what has the medicine been trying to tell me? And for me, it was just that it's not helpful to try to rationalize this experience. Like language, my mind is only able to, to interpret and express what's happening to a such a limited degree that I might as well not try to do it in the first place, which I guess is kind of contradicting to the whole thing we're doing here right now. Uh, but it, it was a reminder that I'm not just um, what's happening up in my head. I'm not just my um, thought experience, but I'm more so my um, the feelings I experience and the kind of underlying subconscious uh, what word do I want to use here basically I'm just I'm more than what I'm thinking yes. and this is something uh, a notion that I kind of knew was true but I, I every so often neglect because I really feel that all there is is what's happening in my head mm -hmm. so neglecting feelings neglecting everything that I'm kind of not able to rationalize. So the medicine gave me a, a nice reminder of that there is more to, to life than just thinking through stuff and making sense of stuff. What else is there? I had this question and I'm not exactly sure how it was framed. Um, 
uh, I think it was related to spirituality or to to believe in a higher power which for me as an atheist I wouldn't say I, I per se believe in a higher power but I'm also not I do not believe that we're able to to know everything there is to be known mm-hmm. I think there's a lot of things that are just we're not able to quantify by any uh, means there's this nice saying by uh, Albert Einstein um, he relates it to the the core of a planet and he says there's a circle into which no measurement will ever lead us so basically there's no way for us putting a thermometer into the core of the sun in order to measure how high it is or any other measurement for that matter there's there's a a a a point to which we have no access to and never will have and this coming out of physics um i think there's also a lot of other things where we will never have access to and i don't see them to be as a god or as divine but i do strongly believe there's a bunch of stuff that we will likely never understand and just for now there's a bunch of stuff we have no clue about that we'll figure out at some point well the universe that we've seen is really big so it's going to take a long time to figure out even one percent of all that i think we did some really um great strides in terms of figuring out things one of the biggest one is coming up with or coming up with i guess more likely mapping out the core elements that make our world in the periodic table that's like super amazing mm-hmm. yeah it definitely changes the way that the brain can pursue patterns you can make some Realizations, I feel like, is the main potential breakthrough area for people who go on mental trips of some kind, where you break some perception that you had, or you look at something that's been a problem for you from a different angle for the first time, and it gives you a a different perspective. Yeah. Yeah, I think it, it... It doesn't give you a different perspective per se, like it's not giving you, or it's not giving you a new perspective. It's just emphasizing a different perspective that you're also able to take if you want to, but it's not the one you, it's not your go-to perspective. Mm -hmm. And yeah, for me, this perspective for the first night has been stop to think, start to feel. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah so after the first night of medicine you kind of you do integration work which is they tell you you talk about the experience with other people you talk about what there is to be taken away from this which in my case would have been to just every once in a while kind of listen into what your heart is saying rather than just trying to make sense of the world which is something I think Anna told me before, not to give her credit for anything. But <laughs> um, yeah, it's been something I knew, uh, but it's not something I, I was able to to facilitate in my life. Yeah, so with that, rather pleasant kind of mind-blowing weird out there experience i went in to the second night with a lot more anticipation like all right let's see what's coming so we talked about these um intentions or frameworks that set out 
So once you're able to see who you have become, which in my case has just been, um, I've be, become this person that has neglected their feelings in order to, to make sense of everything. And there's a lot more that I didn't see in the mirror, which I guess there's still plenty of work to be done, whether with a substance or without it. And in terms of introspection and reflection, but it's already, this is basically the medicine showed me that the issue I'm currently struggling with the most and what I need to, to, to work with to go forward. And the medicine felt, well, you kind of got the point there last night, I guess, but we're going to really drill it into you this time around. So the intention for the second night was merge me back with my soul. And the kind of history or the, the background of that is that they basically say that you, that everyone experiences a, a, a split with their soul moment in their childhood, mm -hmm. which for me kind of sounded like uh, a Freudian idea of psychology. So I'm not quite sure um, what's the background there or where they're taking this from. But they basically say you have this, this moment of split with your personality um, in your childhood and this will have a lasting, non-beneficial um, effect on your life. Basically, your life, not necessarily go downhill from there, but it, it will have lasting effects on you. And there's a lot of different things that could lead to this. So I'm, I'm not sure, um, like, for most people, it's some kind of traumatic event. And I don't think there's like one single event where it's just, um, this was the event that, lead, that led to this soul split, if you want to call it that. And therefore, if you just be able to work through that, you'll be healed. I think it's more of a, a lasting effect where you, um, and, and coaching term, this is called the, the survival mechanisms you you uh, work on. So basically, as a kid or as you're growing up, you learn like you you have learned behaviors. Where, um, for example, if you have a alcoholic, abusive father, you your mechanism to to deal with that would likely be one of avoidance where you try to get out of their way. Mm -hmm. And you learn that tactic and this is likely something that you would um, keep on doing even in other relationships, even though it might not be um, helpful there anymore. So it's basically the, the kind of behavior you learned over time that made you survive, but these behaviors are only helpful to a certain degree. And at some point they're not helpful anymore. And then you might want to find something different to do or so some different way to approach this. Yeah. And I think there's some truth to that. I wouldn't say that everyone has this and like the, the severity of it can very much range from person to person. So it's, yeah, as, as with most thing in psychology, it's like difficult to make a hard claim on, on this being true or not true. So take it with a grain of salt. Anyways, the goal tonight was to merge back with my soul. So I'm kind of looking for, I guess, a childhood experience that had a lasting effect. And you kind of have this intention in the back of your mind. You're not like, I wasn't actively trying to think of something. I was more again, or still trying to surrender to the experience, which got more difficult for me in a sense, because the first night was kind of amazing. So I thought like, Hey, what's going to happen tonight? 
what will happen? So nothing happened. Like literally, I didn't even feel much of the physical effects um, for most of the night where it was a bit cold. The mosquitoes were super, super annoying. But for the most part, I was just laying there waiting for something to happen, hoping for something to happen and just being really just having a lot of anticipation of what there is to come, which yeah, is not helpful. And what happened then was basically myself or the medicine, however you want to frame that, gave me one snippet of a memory. And the memory was, uh, I had to ask my mother on how old I was at the time because I got, had no clue. Um, it's something that happened to me when I was nine years old, uh, eight or nine, something like that. And we went, like the family went rafting. And what happened was that we were like a bunch of boats together and all of my family being on one boat. Um, we, what's the word for it? Like the boat flipped over. There's a specific term. Capsized. Capsized, exactly. Mm. The boat capsized. Nice. And little me falling into the water, water being super cold. Uh, also, you're kind of not breathing out of water is not as easy. True. So it was super uncomfortable. And you kind of, you get back up and I got back up, was like, um, happy I had survived this, but I got back up and it was pitch black. Like I knew I had my eyes open. I knew this, that I was out of the water because I could breathe again, but everything was dark, which didn't make any sense to me. It was super scary. It was like, I had a bunch of things going through my mind. Um, not least of which being, am I dead? Like, is this what being dead is like? Because I just died for some reason. Uh, it was super uncomfortable for what I guess amounts to be a couple of seconds until my parents realized that I was trapped underneath the boat and kindly lifted the boat for me to see some light again. At which point I was like, oh, you truly. And my mind then was able to make sense of the experience. I was like, oh, yeah, you were trapped under a boat. Like, what? what's the big fuss about? But tiny me had not, was not able to kind of um, make sense of the situation at a time. And I've, it felt super depressing, super scary. I felt lonely and abandoned in this, in this dark place. And this feeling I was really feeling back into while laying on this, on the mattress, like it wasn't just me seeing this vision. It was me feeling how I felt at the time. I was like, all right, why are you giving me this memory? Like I knew this happened and I knew this was kind of terrifying. But it's not something that I had been thinking about a bunch of times beforehand or like it's not something that's active on my mind. It's just like the medicine went some weird places in my mind to, to dig, dig up this memory, I guess. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like, all right, what, what am I supposed to do with this? I knew this happened. I knew this was scary. But since I felt all, the, all those feelings again, I thought what there was to do for me was to kind of climb into this memory in order to give myself some, uh, some comfort in this moment, which is to say you're kind of trying to go back in time and tell yourself, it's fine, it will be fine, don't worry about it, in order for me not to feel scared back then, which Turns out that's neither how time nor how memories work. No, that's kind of impossible to do. Um, Unless you're in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, in which case they do it all the time. 
timeline jumping, yeah. going back in time, saying, "No, okay, it's it's fine, dude. You're gonna be okay. Don't be scared." Can you actually do that with this substance? I think of it kind of like you're going into your mental library of all your memories, and that's a very particularly spicy memory. So whoever the librarian is is going to know about that book in particular and the story in there was more yikes and memorable than what you had for breakfast two weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah, so um, climbing into the memory was impossible and it was very uncomfortable. Like, I, I felt so helpless that I kind of reached out for help and having some of the helping people come over. And basically what I wanted was just to, to, to hold someone's hand, to, to have the feeling of someone near me in order not to feel alone in this, even though I knew I was not alone there, but it's just like this overwhelming feeling of, of being helpless and lonely. So again, not a party drug. Not a very pleasant experience per se. Uh, so someone came over and kind of held my hand. Just they they have a bunch of things they can do to shift the energy of your experience, which I think most of it is just giving you a good feeling, which already is um, will change a lot in the experience. Um, so you're just, yeah, you kind of tell them there's something wrong and they, they do a bunch of demonic things um, that makes you feel better, but based on you feeling better, it will already make the change. Um, we're talking about ayahuasca. Um, yeah, so I was trying to climb, or again, after like having been helped, I tried again to climb back into the memory, realizing yet again, this was not something I'm, or I guess anyone is able to do. So I had to figure out what to do with it, if I can't change it. And this is where the realization came, all right, like I'm, I'm doing the same mistake. I was doing um, the night before, which is I'm just all in my head. And what I'm trying to do right now is my head trying to to, to help me feeling good about feeling good in the moment in the past, which is just kind of, yeah, you could see how that's not ever going to work. And what there is to do for me is to realize, all right, I'm not my mind being able to go back there. Rather that I'm still the kid trapped underneath a boat who's super scared. And rather than giving myself comfort, I need to realize, all right, I need to just forgive my mind for not being able to make sense of it at the time. So it, it's, again, the same story as the night before. It's just, I'm not just up here. Um, I'm something different than just my um, thought. I'm something different than just what I can rationalize. I'm more this feeling thing that also kind of has thinking on top of it. You would say overall this was a productive and good experience and realization? Well, it's kind of the same story as the first night. So it did, felt like, yeah, I feel kind of stupid that you need to tell me this twice. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> um, it was, I think it's, it got from the purely, um, mental experience it into the embodied more emotional experience of it so it was like already a shift 
from the first night to the second. And um, basically I was just amazed by, by why this memory, why, why are you giving me this? Like is, there's other weird shit that happened to me and there's other stuff that you could have brought up. Why exactly this? And why you're kind of making me work through this memory in order to get to this realization. And yeah, I was just kind of blown away by the proposed methods that the, the, the medicine uses to work on you. So I would say it was definitely a good experience, although just waiting for five hours, having to drink five cups of a, a disgusting liquid, like, I would have liked it to be easier. But then again, I don't think easy is necessarily the, the path you'd... Um, like, doing ayahuasca is not necessarily the easy uh, thing to take on. Like, if you want it easy, it's it's not the thing to do. All right. So, we're kind of two hours into the conversation already. Mm-hmm. And we're kind of at a halfway point in the story. So I feel like we should split this up into two parts and kind of have, um, can answer some questions and whatnot, if there are any. And then we continue the, um, the story next time on, because otherwise we'd go for hours and I need to eat lunch at some time. That is fair. How do you feel about that? Good. Yeah, we could tie this up as part one of the journey of the mind with a tradition and an old medicine from Costa Rica. Now, from Colombia, but uh, administered in Costa Rica. From Colombia, felt... imported to Costa Rica. <laughs> yeah, the, the kind of thing is that for most people, I don't think they think of Colombia as being a super safe country. Mm -hmm. like, I wouldn't. Um, in the stark contrast to Costa Rica, where everyone's kind of like, yeah, you don't have to worry about much. So they wanted to, to make their resort in a really safe environment. And they worked a long time with the government in Costa Rica in order to to have them be able to do this in a legal and um, thoughtful, thought through way. Like it's not just a bunch of people going there to, to do some tripping. But it, it's, they want to do it to the benefit of the people there and they want to do it in a responsible manner. So they, they did a bunch of work to, to make this happen. And they wanted to do it in Costa Rica specifically because it was an environment that, or a country that felt safe to have a container for this environment in. Yeah, you could also say that the entire experience is somewhat religious. So arguing for some freedoms in that vein of, hey, people have done this for a long time for mental and spiritual healing so they should be able to continue that practice if they so elect well thank you for sharing there's, the story with this yeah there's a, a couple of healing churches in brazil that use ayahuasca fairly regularly so it's like i think it's even legal to use in the u.s under the freedom of religion um act Mm -hmm. to some degree i'm like not a legal expert but it, it's a medicine that has a lot of tradition and has been part of um a big chunk of the indigenous uh, american culture in the amazon basin mm -hmm. for as long as we know at least like as we said the claim is five thousand years which yeah is problematic to quantify but it is what it is so there's a good reason for, for this substance to be at least semi-legal in these areas. Mm -hmm. um, someone brought up the nutrition. This is interesting. 
since there's a good likelihood of you puking or you um, just having a lot of diarrhea while on the medicine, um, you're not supposed to eat um, up to six -ish hours before um, before taking the medicine. So basically, you don't get um, dinner. You're only um, running on the food you're able to take in during lunchtime, which can be difficult. Like uh, I felt like I should need to eat more. But after the second or third night of, of taking the medicine, you're kind of looking at the buffet they have um, at lunch and kind of going like, all right, which of these things are easy to puke? <laughs> Which is not something you usually think about, but it's interesting at least. But yeah, it's like, um, it's nice to have, to fill up on nutrition afterwards, but you also, you want to be kind of going into on an empty stomach because there's, you want to be well hydrated though, because it's, it's, yeah, you'll be sweating, you'll be be getting rid of a lot of water so you want to keep um, hydrated as much as you can and what they tell you to do is to drink coconut water because it also has some nutritional value to it you're not just drinking water electrolytes and i think it has greater than zero sugar as well so you get some energy from it i can't help but to think of idiocracy when you said electrolytes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, interesting thing about electrolytes is that I think the movie is making fun of this aspect that it sounds some, like something a science that your body needs. But if you're eating a normal balanced diet, you don't normally need additional electrolytes from your beverage. You could have it, but you don't really need it unless you're doing something that is spending a lot of salt, such as sweating. If you're exercising, then it might be good to have a beverage with that. But if you're sitting in a chair, maybe not. Well, cool. Right. So we wanna... So this, uh, just wanted to give a bit of time for if there's any other questions in chat for people wanting to know. Ah, uh, someone asked how expensive it was. Um, there's a different range of options you have in different areas of the world where um, ayahuasca is legal. I think ranging from like 2K for a week up to 5K per week, kind of depending on how fancy you want the place to be. And I, I want to link this for anyone that is um, thinks this is a good idea. Uh, I found it to be rather um, in-depth and good information. It talks about all the things um, you kind of want to consider before going there, and especially the things you want to consider when you have decided that you want to do ayahuasca, what there is to to think about in terms of which place am I taking or um, who do I trust to uh, provide me with this experience. So I think this is quite helpful in terms of kind of getting a sense of first what you're getting into and secondly how to um, how to make good decisions based on that. Mm. Um, there's a question what's the um, What's the motive um, to to take this? Um, there's three different reasons people take the medicine. Um, one is to find um, spiritualism, like people find it easier to connect with a different realm, I guess you can call it, um, while on the medicine. So this is what's happening in those healing churches a lot in in Brazil, where you're kind of tapping into a, a spirit world. 
or um, in the tradition, it's like basically being able to talk to your ancestry. Hmm. And the second thing, which was um, the thing we went for, I think spirituality had an aspect to it. Since I'm an atheist, I wanted to kind of see what that would feel like to be in touch with something spiritual. Um, the second aspect would be healing. Um, like there's the medicine can address certain uh, certain psychological issues by providing you a different view on it or by providing you um, giving you a different sense of who you are and then it basically it lets you run wild with the interpretations of that they're saying like it's not clear cut out what the medicine is trying to tell you you just kind of have to figure it out by yourself so but it's there's like they still work on finding good um means to measure it um so there's a lot of research going into this topic right now but a lot of self-reported uh, experiences with ayahuasca have been that people found it to be super beneficial in the moment to kind of get this new experience, new sense of quote unquote reality, but only as much as they were able to integrate it into their life. So yeah, there is arguably there is benefit for you, but it's not really quantified yet. And it's like, yeah, it will be beneficial if you make something out of it. It will be tripping balls or it could be tripping balls without any benefits. Um, and that's the third reason people do it. It's just to have this experience. The, these are what's usually called the psychonauts that are just doing, um, doing psychedelics for the psychedelic sake, mm -hmm. which is fair. And yeah, if that's what you want to do and you're doing it in a safe way, that's okay, I guess. But I wouldn't recommend ayahuasca if that's your goal, because it's not a pleasant experience there's other substances that are much more suitable to do that i think ayahuasca is more for you to to kind of look inward and to to do something with it rather than just tripping balls Um, do you need an excuse to go tripping balls? I guess not. Kind of def depends on who you're justifying it to. But in general, I'd say no. But the question I would raise is, do you want to be tripping balls while puking and sitting on the toilet at the same time? Or is there better ways to do that if it's just about the tripping ball balls part? That's not looking all that well with all those carriers. Yeah, I don't really know PvP, and it's starting my MMR for this random at where my Zerg was, so I basically just will lose every Terran and Protoss game for a while. I just placed Masters 1 random, which I know I'm not. My Zerg can box at this level, but that was like a 5.3k, so I could face him on my main account. But I got him in PvP, and I have no idea how that works. He opened Oracle and killed a bunch of my probes, so I was just behind for most of the game. And then I did a blink play, which he defended. But we were focusing on the story, and it was its own story. But instead of being scared under a boat, I was in a PvP in GM. But my Protoss vs. Protoss is like diamond. <laughs> we took bases, though.
cannons and void race. That's a good, pretty good strat PvP. Well, cool. So we can call this episode one of the uh, journey of the mind with Ayahuasca and a chafer tomb. So they, did we settle on a title yet? Is it tripping balls in the jungle? Uh, Part one. I think Psychonaut is a fun title. It's also a really good band. Yeah. It's a mental journey that is unusual in the methodology. You're going pretty far away from standard sobriety with something that has a cultural tradition in the world. So humans have done this for some time, and we've had a nice conversation about it. Thank you, chat, for tuning in and participating in the conversation. Thank you, Mr. Echi Fatoum, for your wise and words. And cool story in Costa Rica. We will see you on the next episode of Philosopher Clock. Thank you for having me. GG.